Recall that in the previous video we had shown that if I have a continuous time signal x of t and I sample it to produce a discrete time signal x of n, then I can associate a Fourier transform with the discrete time signal x of n. And the Fourier transform of the discrete time, or the sampled signal now, is given by 1 over t times the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of shifted versions of the original signal Fourier transform. And the amount that these versions are shifted by is omega sub s, where which is 2 pi over t, and that's the sampling frequency. In terms of hertz, we would talk about the sampling frequency as being 1 over 2, t. Well, in this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about reconstructing the continuous time signal from its samples. We're also going to talk about the sampling theorem, which specifies how fast we need to sample a signal to do the reconstruction. So to start, we're going to take a, a canonical sort of example, one that I can draw, and that is to assume that x of t is a band-limited signal. Now what we mean by band-limited is that it has no energy above a certain frequency. So if I sketch a spectrum, say x of omega, and the example we're going to do is the famous triangle spectrum. And so we'll have this corner be at B and minus B. And band limited means that x of omega is equal to 0 for magnitude of omega greater than B. Now we're going to consider several cases. And I'm going to start with omega sub s being greater than 2B. In that case, if I sketch the spectrum of the sample signal, the Fourier transform of the sample signal, we'll call this x, s of omega, recall that we have replicates of the original spectrum shifted to be centered on multiples of the sampling frequency. So I have one at the origin, and that's the k equals zero term in our sum, and this amplitude is now 1 over t. And I'm going to have another replicate at omega sub s. And this is omega s minus b. And this is omega s plus b. So this was the k equals 1 term. And then I'm going to have a k equals 2 term at 2 omega sub s, and so on. Well, if we talk about the problem of reconstruction, which really amounts to getting x of t back from x of n, that's equivalent to getting x of omega from x s of omega. So if you look at this expression or this picture here for x s of omega, is there a way that we can extract x of omega from this picture? And the answer is yes. If I simply multiply x s of omega by h r of omega, and we'll make that function to be t, because we have to account for the 1 over t. So we're going to make that t, and it's going to be have a value t from out to frequency omega s over 2. So remember, in this case, omega s over 2 is greater than b, minus omega s over 2. And if I multiply these two things in the frequency domain, I will get back my signal for a transform that I started with. So that's a simple way to reconstruct. Now this multiplication by this function can be viewed as really what amounts to low pass filtering because we're passing the low frequency components of XS and we're attenuating the high frequency components. Well, it's useful to look at this operation in the time domain. Recall that what we've shown is that X of omega can be recovered by taking x s of omega and multiplying it by h r of omega. And if I convert that to the time domain, that says that x of t should be given by the, well, here we have multiplication in frequency, so that's going to be convolution in time. And the continuous time representation for x of n is the sum 
n equals minus infinity to infinity of x of n delta of t minus n t. So that's my Fourier transform of x s of omega. I have to convolve that with h r of t. We have a simple convolution here. There's a, there's a sum of a bunch of terms, but each of these terms, remember you can convolve the terms one by one and then add them up at the end because the convolution is a linear operation. So if I convolve the impulse with hr, what that does is shift hr to the location at which the impulse occurs, which is at time nt. So we get that x of t is a sum n equals minus infinity to infinity x of n hr of t minus nt. And it's fairly simple to show that hr of t is given by t times the sine of omega sub s over 2 times t divided by pi times t. And this, if we substitute this into our expression for x of t, we get that x of t can be expressed in terms of the samples x of n, sum n equals minus infinity to infinity, x of n, and then we'll have sine of omega s over 2 times t minus nt divided by pi times t minus nt. So hr of t in this case is just a sinc function, and what this says is that we're adding up shifted sinc functions. They're shifted by multiples of the sampling interval, and their amplitudes are scaled by the samples x of n. This is called ideal band-limited interpolation. We can sketch this. So what we have is that for each sample x of n, we have a sinc function that's centered at nt. So this is value x of 0. It's centered at 0, and you see the sinc function here. And that sinc function has 0 crossings at multiples of t. So at the, where the other samples occur, at time t, at 2t, and so on, all these sinc functions have zero crossings, and the amplitude is defined entirely by the sample x of n. So it exactly reconstructs those amplitudes. And what happens in between is these sinc functions add up in a way, shown by my red curve here. These sinc functions add up in a way to produce a smooth curve or a smooth signal going through those points. And that makes sense because we're, we've said that the signal was band-limited which means it can't have arbitrarily fast frequency fluctuations. And the sinc function, the smoothness of the sinc function, is limiting the rate at which the signal can change in the time domain. And that smoothness is defined by the bandwidth that we're dealing with when we sample. The reason this is called ideal band-limited interpolation is because the low-pass filters that we're using to do the interpolation are ideal. That is, they have perfect unity response, and then they go to zero instantaneously and stay there forever. Or in the time domain, as shown in this expression here, we've got these sinc functions, which have uh, infinite duration. So at any point in time, I not only have an infinite number of samples contributing to my signal, by all, each of these sinc functions goes infinitely forward and infinitely back, making this a non-causal process. So this is not a practical strategy for interpolation, but we'll talk about one of those uh, later on in a future lecture. Well, let's now consider another case for the sampling frequency. Suppose that the sampling frequency, omega sub s, is equal to twice the bandwidth of our signal. In that case, we can sketch and what happens is that the x sub s of omega, what happens is that the shifted replicates begin to touch. So this is b, this is omega sub s, but that's also 2b. This will be 4b, which is 2 omega sub s, and of course this is 3b, and so on. And again, we're scaled by 1 over t. So as we decrease the sampling frequency, remember the first case, it was that omega sub s was greater than 2b. Now they're equal to 2b. 
And these shifted replicates, which I'm labeling here according to their index in the sum, these shifted replicates begin to touch. Different situation entirely when omega sub s is less than 2b. Because in that case, what happens is the shifted replicates start to overlap. So recall the expression says that we add up all these shifted replicates. So in these regions of overlap, we end up, in this case, with a, a sum that is quite different than the uh, spectrum that we started with. Now, because these are triangles, I can easily add them, although drawing them is always a challenge. And you can see that in these regions here between omega s minus b and omega and b, that we have overlap and the two things add up to give us a quite different value of the spectrum. Well, because of this overlap in these uh, shifted rep replicates, we can't uniquely recover x of t from x of n. The problem that arises here is that in this region of the spectrum, we have a sum of two things. We know what the sum is, but we don't know what the individual components are. So if I tell you the sum of two numbers is equal to three, you can't uniquely tell me what the two numbers are. You can give me a lot of possibilities, but you can't give me a unique solution. And that's basically what's happening here. There's no way to separate this where these overlap and to pull it apart into its individual terms. Now this is called aliasing because frequency components in the shifted replicate, and I've just written down here x of omega minus omega s, it shows up in the uh, overlapping with the higher frequencies of x of omega. In other words, it shows up in the wrong place. So we call that aliasing. So this leads us to the sampling theorem, also sometimes called the Nyquist theorem. And the sampling theorem says that if x of t is band limited with zero energy above frequency b, then x of t is uniquely determined by its samples x of n equals x of nt, provided that the sampling frequency, omega s, which is 2 pi over t, exceeds twice the bandwidth. We have some terms here. The frequency, omega equals b, is called the Nyquist frequency. And the frequency, omega equals 2b, is called the Nyquist rate because that's the minimum rate at which we can sample a signal and still satisfy the sampling theorem.